Uh, I was in private practice. Jackie was a partner with me in that same practice. And uh, I was on, I think, my third, deep, third depot restoration before she joined us. Things got a little slow, and uh, she decided to take a leave of absence and write a book. I said, well, that's great. What are you going to write it on? And she said, depots. I said, nobody's going to read a book on depots. Why don't you do something like code? No, I'm going to do depots. So I said, okay, if you're going to do depots, I'm going to do it with you. You can't do it by yourself. And lo and behold, after about uh, uh, visits of approximately 300 depots here in the state, and those out of state, uh, we argued for the next 25 years on what depots would go into this book. And uh, we finally came to that conclusion. We have that available tonight, uh, $15. And it's not just about the depots. It's more of a coffee table book that uh, deals with the stories behind the depots being built. So with that, Jackie, do you have anything to add? No, I think we're ready to start. OK. Oh, she does everything. I mean, she's on the camera, she's doing the light. <laughs> okay, so as we explore the lure of the train station, we uh, give some attention here to Tim Parks, who offered uh, the following. He says, the train station is the ideal scenario for greetings and farewells. What does it mean to be set off in a car? Nothing. The airport is too exhausting and impersonal. The plane itself is remote and unseen. Could you please speak up a little Here at the powerful beast of the locomotive thrust to its nose under the great arch of the station, the line straightened from the last bend. Clanking and squealing, the train slows. The last moments of waiting begin. Eyes focused on the platform, keen to possess their loved ones. In the train corridor, meanwhile, the long-awaited beloved is jostling and jostled, luggage at his heels. The train slows and slows and slows, teasing everyone on both sides of the divide, making them wait, making them savor the tension between absence and presence. Now, we have given this presentation before, as you can tell, and the very first one I gave, and it's happened twice this year already, uh, I'm approached afterwards saying, well, that was a pretty good presentation, but I ex expected to see lighthouses. <laughs> so I don't want to disappoint anybody. So this is one of two lighthouses that you will see. But it also is very symbolic because the railroads, um, as many of you may or may not know, transformed human history human society, like nothing else. Um, for the first time in human history, we built towns like Atlanta, Los Angeles, Denver, that were all based on the railroad. Towns were no longer subject to the commerce of what could come and be shipped by waterway along the rivers and oceans and the inland seas, if you will. It changed it in such fashion that we'll see that it impacted virtually every aspect of society, not only here in the United States, but in the world. So case in point, anytime you have shortening of time that it takes to do something, the more impact you have on history and on human society. For example, Rochester Mackinac City, 265 miles, right? If we were going to walk that, which was one of the means of transportation before the railroads came in around 1830, We'd walk 12 to 14 days at eight hours per day before we'd make it. We could ride a horse nine to 10 days, eight hours a day on the back of a horse. We could take the stagecoach three to four days, but these days would be 12 to 18 hours long. And they would pack it just like you see it in the photograph too. Okay. Enter the steam locomotive and all of a sudden, in 1900, you've cut that time to five hours. From days to hours. Now, how many are planning to go up north this weekend? Yeah, good. Because I don't think we've improved it that much since, because anyone <laughs> with the auto, it's going to take you a, a good four hours to get there. Now, the first railroad 
really wasn't a steam locomotive like we think of. It was pulled by a horse on tracks, and what they called was uh, strap tracks. And basically what that was, I don't know if you can see it here, but it was a, a, a steel rail that was boulder attached to wood uh, rails. And the steel was just a way to let that wear properly. Um, we have reports, we've read news accounts where those sometimes those rails would pop loose and of course it would want to curl up and it actually punctured some of the uh, carriages. So you want to be careful where you're sat in those carriages. Now, it, uh, this was the time, 1830s or so, that's when uh, the steam locomotive was first introduced. But we still had canals. In fact, we had canals here in Rochester, and we'll learn a little bit more about that. Um, but here's what we found about canals, and this is very interesting. Um, the first one was the Erie Canal, 1817, and it would take six horses to pull one ton over land. You put it on a canal boat, a barge, and it would only take one ho or two horses to pull 50 tons. That is a tremendous increase. So the idea was, is that we've got these waterways, and, I think we can change that. and it was going to connect to the Erie Canal across. Now, what happens in 1830, we have this uh, little Tom Thumb, Wilson Motor, right? and it delivers uh, 50 people from uh, Baltimore, or actually, um, Mount Clair, 50 people, it goes 13 miles at about 16 miles per hour. And this is revolutionary. It goes to Elcott City, Maryland. Now, if you're a historical society member or interested in history, this is the, the grandest of all because you have two depots that can claim, rightfully so, that they were the first people in America. Because you had to depart from one depot and arrive at the next depot, right? So everybody's shaking their head and yeah, something to see where it's going. But if you go to the next one, here's some of the impact that we had. We saw talk about the canals, but we also had the National Road, the National uh, Pike Road at Baltimore to Cumberland, 140 miles, nine dollars per person, and it took you 20 hours to navigate that. The railroad comes in. The B&O, now it's $7 per person, and you can do it in half the time. Who do you think is going to win out? So, along with the railroads come depots. And the purpose of the depot was twofold. One, it was to promote company business, which was commerce, freight. And it was also to control train movement at that time. And they didn't do a real good job at it. But we're left with a legacy of how they did this with our current travel today. You know those little tickets you get on your luggage and it has a three-letter designation? Well, thank you, railroads, because they came up with that to de identify depots throughout the country. You know your message board that tells you when your flights are departing and arriving? Well, thank you, railroads, because what you did is you gave us that odd number, even number. North uh, and eastbound flights are even number. South and westbound flights are odd number. Again, it goes back to the railroad setting up those standards. Now, I said that they didn't do a real good job at controlling the train movement. And uh, there's reason for that. One is that usually there was only a single track. And they had no way to communicate between uh, train and crews on the train and the various depots until this little invention. Everybody recognizes that? Yeah. Telegraph. Exactly, the telegraph. And it changed the landscape of America. Uh, invented in 1844. And the landscape we see now are telegraph poles up and down the railroad tracks. In fact, Telegraph Road gets its name from the telegraph because that was a service road or the telegraph. And our first depot, does anybody recognize where this is? Oh, these guys are good. Yeah. We're in trouble. <laughs> yes, it is, Port Huron. 
And there was a, a, of course, you probably know then that there was Thomas Edison, the little guy that was there, uh, 13 years old, and um, he learned to operate the telegraph from there. He also set up his first business. He became a news butcher on the train between Port Huron and Detroit. A news butcher is just somebody that would go around and sell newspapers and candies and refreshments. He was so successful at this that he had other boys working for him. So quite an entrepreneur at the time. And now we're going to look at some of our early railroad stations. Uh, we see here uh, four that are all dating from about the 1850s, which are some of the earliest ones that we see in Michigan. We've got Eaton Rapids up there uh, from 1850, below at Mount Clemens, 1859, then of course Port Huron, and uh, Clarkston, 1851. And some of the characteristics that we see on these early stations generally include uh, brick construction or wood board and batten. They usually have a gable style roof. We don't yet see more intricate roof designs, just very simple. The building is generally simple, rectangular in shape. And at this point in time, they were missing one key feature uh, that we see on all the railroad stations today. Does anybody know what feature we're missing? How about, uh, let's see if I can, how about this right here that was added on to Mount Clemens? The station master's window. Remember the, the train wreck we saw a minute ago? Well, they realized very quickly after constructing these that they needed a way to see up and down the track at the same time. And so after that point, we see stations uh, constructed with station master's windows. Here we have cold water. Again, uh, one of our very early stations, 1850s. And in the foreground there, you see the original station for cold water. It's wood construction, that simple gable shaped roof and simple body, that board and batten siding, and this one happens to have a little bit of fretwork up there on the roof. But the railroad companies built the stations very sturdy and very uh, mobile. They were set up with a framing system that was similar to our modular homes today, and so they could very easily be picked up and put on a flatbed and taken to another town. And that happened very often. So when a town wanted a station and they were going to have their first station, a lot of times it would come from another town. So then in the background there, you see the second station that Coldwater got in 1883, a much more substantial station made out of brick and kind of in the Italianate style. So they had proven themselves worthy of having a more substantial station. Well, eventually they were able to get their original station back, and so that's why we see both from there. I think one of them is a retail shop today, and the other one is a, a beauty shop. It's a good restaurant. Oh, it's a Mexican restaurant now. Okay. We, we found that out last time we gave the presentation. So most of the life of uh, uh, Coldwater Depot, the wood frame one, was in Batavia, Michigan. And this has been documented to be the oldest depot in the state, uh, surpassing that of uh, the one at Greenfield Village. This is a another 1850 station. This is in Birch Run, Michigan. And as Ron and I set out to find these remaining Michigan Railroad stations, it was sometimes kind of difficult to find them. Uh, we would do our general search. We have some, um, some pre-existing histories that had been written by other folks that were hunting the stations and, and striving to, to preserve them. And we follow some of those resources. Of course, you look in town near the railroad track, right? Uh, near the elevator, if there's an elevator. But oftentimes, because they were so mobile, people would uh, pick them up and move them out to their farm. And so we were hunting for this one one day, and we couldn't find it anywhere. Folks in town told us where to look, and we couldn't find it anywhere. And so we had gone down this road that happened to be a dead end, and we had to turn around and come back the other direction. And when we came back the other direction, we could see the C&O, Chesapeake, Ohio, on the end of this building. It was only on one end. So we had to turn around and come back before we could discover it. Now this is a map in uh, 1860, just before the Civil War. And if you notice, uh, the North has quite a few uh, lines of railroads, much more uh, mileage than the South. Total in the United States at that time was about 30,000 miles worth of, uh, uh, worth of rail. But the railroads played a very important part in the Civil War, probably uh, not receiving as much credit as it should. 
Oh, this is the same map. It illustrates it a little bit better as to the amount of uh, traffic we have, 1860. So Civil War occurs, and what depot do we associate with it? Well, we have to go to Springfield, Illinois, and Lincoln's Depot. This is the depot he left for Washington from. He gave a farewell address to his people saying he would return, and of course he did uh, at the end of his assassination, taking the same route in the funeral cars uh, that he did on the way to Washington. By the way, those funeral cars were Pullman cars, and Mr. Pullman, uh, while he was, I'm sure, very grieved at the death of the president, he also saw an opportunity to have his Pullman cars viewed by thousands of people. And so the Pullman cars were donated for the purpose of carrying Mr. Lincoln back to Springfield. I have a question. Sure. On that pretty slide, you have three dates at the bottom. What are the three dates? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> No, uh, the 1852 was when it was originally built, and I think there was a fire, and it was reconstructed in 1857, and then restored in 1968. I believe those are the So the, the railroad, and ironically now, I, I mentioned that the South had much less mileage of rail than the North, but they quickly saw the advantages, and in the first battle of Bull Run, it was the reinforcements from the Confederates that was brought by train to the battle. And of course, that ensured their victory at Battle of Bull Run. Now, we haven't fought any battles here in Oakland County, but the railroad still played a very important role. Holly was, at that time, the northernmost reach of any railroad in the state. And its distinction is that it was a crossroads. It was the first um, Union Depot. A Union Depot is when one or two or more railroads share the same depot, the same building. That makes it a Union Depot. Well, Holly, because that was the northernmost extent of it, anybody coming from the north, they quickly made their way to Holly and boarded a train. In fact, records show that Holly, this little town in 1860, got over a thousand men in one day as they board the train. And now it's been said, and I don't have no proof of it, but it's been said because Michigan was one of the first states to uh, answer the call of Lincoln, at, to call to arms, he repeated or stated the phrase, thank God for Michigan. So I like to think that it goes back because we were able to deliver uh, those troops very quickly. So the war is over, right? And it just explodes with the railroads. In fact, in 1890, 90% of the steel that was produced in this country went for the railroads. And if you think about that, the steel, and your Carnegie in a whole steel industry, it made the Gilded Age. And it was because of the railroads. Uh, you can see how uh, 1860, there was 30,000 miles of track. By 1900, there was 193,000 miles of track, and 10 years later, that almost doubled to 350,000 miles of track. Incredible staggering, staggering statistic. At that time, there was expected to be, uh, anticipated that 40,000 depots existed. We figure about 20,000 remain today. And when you look at it on a world scale, uh, the United States, in the red there, you can see where it surpasses all of Europe combined. In fact, even today, the United States has more rail mileage than any other nation in the world, including number two, which is China, about twice as much as what China has. Now, in Michigan, you can see that we're starting to expand a little bit further north. This is Lower Peninsula. There's another whole expansion going on in the Upper Peninsula, and that's because of the uh, uh, mines up there in Calumet, and, but those lines came through Wisconsin. Um, we estimate there's a, probably about uh, 2,000 depots in Michigan. Today, there are about 300 left remaining. Oakland County had more depots than any other county in the state, and we'll see what's happening with those depots shortly. This is the Jackson Station, and this uh, is the station that you can still uh, catch the train from. 
It is the uh, oldest depot that's been in continuous operation that is uh, east of the Mississippi. So it, today it accommodates train traffic, it also has bus stop here, taxi, and of course uh, regular uh, auto, private automobiles. Um, but the styles of the depots often follow, follow the styles that were popular in residential architecture. And so at this point in time, Italianate architecture was becoming popular, and so we see the stations start to follow or mimic that same style. This is Clio 1871, and what we found is that these railroad corporations would utilize standardized plans for their stations, and so they might use the same uh, footprint or floor plan, but create different looking stations from that. And we often call those sister stations. So here's Clio in its uh, simple uh, gable roof there, and of course with the station master's woman going out. And its sister station we found up in Ever. So uh, they use the same similar floor plan and uh, basically the same body and, and shape to it. Ron and I got involved in this one when they got a grant to uh, restore the station, use part of it for City Hall and part of it for the new Rails to Trails users. So we were able to restore the station and uh, paint it back to its original colors, which were somewhat shocking to the folks that had always seen it white. This is a little station. Uh, it's been in Deerfield, it's been in Adrian, and it's currently in Blissfield. It dates from 1874, and I think it's currently their city uh, EDA, EDA office. office. Uh, again, we know it's it's a pretty early station because it has the gable-shaped roof and the board and batten siding, but it uh, just shows you how movable those were. Kalamazoo, this is 1874. I think this is the GR9 station. Uh, when we first saw this one, it was pretty dilapidated, and so was the area around it. And then a foundation bought it and restored it, and uh, it's beautiful now today, again, in, in that Italianate style. And it also was a catalyst to the area around it, and many of the buildings around it then it made improvements, and it's a rather nice area of town now. So the depot can really uh, act as that catalyst for community. Is it unusual to have second floor on a depot? You know, we're going to talk a little bit about that, those second floors. It is unusual, very unusual, and so we're going to talk about it just a little bit later. When we first saw it, this was a restaurant, and we, it, we were really questioning, do we really want to go in? <laughs> and uh, fortunately, it's been restored. <laughs> oh, another accident. So actually, the telegraph had some impact, but what was missing was the time. Now, if you can imagine this, um, everything was on local time. What was local time measured by? The sun, right? Had been for eons. I mean, ever since human history, we measured it by the sun. Well, we were speaking in, uh, give me an illustration of this, we were speaking in Indiana. She was, uh, in the hotel we were in, she was at one end of the hotel, I was at the other one, and it was in two different time zones. <laughs> And when we said, well, when do we meet? And they said, well, 9 o'clock. And it was like, well, did they mean Eastern time or Central time? And, oh, it doesn't matter. We just kind of show up around 9 and people will come in. As late. But if you can imagine, in Indiana, there were 27 different time zones. Now, you know how narrow Indiana was. Now, as a traveler, can you imagine, OK, I'm leaving Detroit at this time, but when I get to Grand Rapids, what time it will be? I there was no way of knowing. There was no way of controlling that train movement. Or even though they could communicate with the trains, there was no way of controlling it because they're all in different times. So we have the railroads to thank for our time zones. And how that worked, and I found this to be fascinating, um, it was called Day of News. Now, it took us about 40 years before the public accepted it. But the railroads were on it uh, prior to that for, like I say, 40 years. And what they did is, uh, one minute before noon, every day, they would stop telegraph traffic. And when a telegraph came back online, it signaled that was 12 o'clock in New York City or wherever their headquarters were at that time. And that indicated to the station to set your standard clock, which is what you see, your regulator clock in each station, 
to whatever time it was. It was 12 if you were on Eastern Standard, Central Time, if you, you know, so on and so forth. And then, of course, you'd see the conductors. And they would always set their pocket watches to whatever the standard clock was, the regulator clock in the depot. Now, Detroit was the only exception to this. And they didn't know what to do because they were kind of included in the Eastern Time Zone, but they really fell in the Central Time Zone. So it took them a few more years to, uh, to finally accept that we'll be in the Eastern Time Zone. Uh, this is one of the phrases. I won't read it. Uh, I think this is in the Rochester paper. So you can see that they, they maybe even in the city there's different time zones. That last phrase there, that the same time throughout the length and the breadth of our city. Well, I mean, how big is Rochester? You're going to have different time zones. But once the time zones came in, that made the, um, the trains really efficient. They ran, you know, right on uh, the Johnny on the spot. And we began to see a change in the depot designs. They wanted to advertise that. And what better way to advertise it than to put in a clock tower? That was Niles, by the way. We also, at this time now, the Civil War taught us two things, that we could move people just as efficiently as we could um, commerce and freight. And we saw a change in the ads that were out there. For example, ladies, you don't need a, a male escort to take you on a train ride or visit your mother or whatever. Kids, they can go. We'll watch over them. Everything is different now with the railroads. And look at the luxury of that Pullman car at this point in history. <laughs> And then one of the great advertising themes of all time was sleep like a kitten, and wake refresh or something like that. I forget the rest of those. Of course, this is the of uh, Walmart, Ohio, right? In 1935, you had Nip and Tuck, which was the kittens. But the dad, I don't know where the dad was. He didn't show up to 37. But when the dad did show up, of course, he went off to war, along with every other male in the country. And uh, it was part of the recruiting campaign. And of course, he returns to mother and uh, uh, three kittens, or two kittens. And even today, when Chessie's system bought out uh, Walmart, Ohio, and merged with them, it became the Chessie system railroad with the outline of the cat. And even CSX, which it is now merged again, they played around with it. I don't know if you can see here in the sea, the cat. Now, since then, I understand uh, CSX is more freight. They don't really deal with passengers. And so I think the idea of sleep like a kitten really didn't apply to them. Um, when I've done the research, I've seen that they've gone through several different mascots, I'll call them. I think one was a snake, one was a rat. Uh, I don't know. It was crazy. I don't think they really settled on one. So. But we also see now the depots taking on a different character on the interior. Those wooden benches that were so hard, like these are really soft, it became more contoured. We see Palami tiles starting to be introduced and central heating into the fireplace. We had separation, um, ladies from gentlemen, okay? And I, we liken it to the smoky, non smoky, there was chewing and not chewing areas. Now it's 1880, and the railroads have really um, began to make profit from this passenger traffic they're doing. And so they want to attract more passengers, and how beautiful their railroad stations can be. So they actually held a competition to see if they could make their stations more aesthetically beautiful. And so architects uh, entered their designs, and this was the one that was chosen for Chelsea, Michigan. This is a Michigan Central Station. And again, that we see the station following the style that is popular in architecture for the home residents. So this is kind of a Victorian stick style. And uh, we would see more detail, more ornamentation. Hooligans. They were hooligans, that's all I can say. <laughs> so there were some hooligans in Chelsea, and they decided that they would tie a cable around the base of the railroad station. 
and tie it to the back of a departing train. <laughs> and when the train pulled out, it took the station right off from its foundation. Now this is some more of the corporate styling that we saw in railroad company and their architecture. As uh, the stations began to progress and become more beautiful, we see these bracket designs become more elaborate. At Harbor Springs there on the left, we see GR and I's typical bracket with the circle shape inside of the triangular shape. Uh, in the center there at Harbor Beach, Pierre Marquette has more of a, on a graceful arching bracket that they use. And then on the right, uh, I think that's Michigan Central there, in Brooklyn, 1882, again, a very graceful bracket with some additional ornamentation on it. So we can even begin to recognize some of the stations by their ornament and detail. In fact, these are some Michigan Central stations. And Michigan Central would tend to use the same fence post over and over again. And so when we see that fence post, we'll say, ah, oh, I bet that's a Michigan Central station. Uh, again, the ornament and detail is very much following the residential architecture. And so we came across this one one day, and uh, we didn't quite place it as a depot at first. Because when we first saw it, it looked like this. And sometimes you have to look at a building a little bit, and then study it and say, hey, wait a minute, is there something more here? And the back had not been painted as elaborately. So we, uh, we, we've gotten to know the owner of that building and made some recommendations on his painting scheme. And it's toned down a little bit more. Does anybody uh, recognize it, have stopped at it when they were traveling north? After you cross the bridge on US 2, that's a little gift shop that sits there. That's the second depot you'll see. You won't see any more now. Second lighthouse. Third lighthouse. <laughs> this is in Gaines, 1884. Uh, Grand Trunk had a little design that they would do with this cream-colored brick and then the orange brick uh, as the insets. And we see this at a couple of stations along in the Gaines and Fenton area. Uh, a little bit uh, more steeply pitched roof than we would usually see for this time period. Just a little bit gothic there with that design. What's it it's their library. And some cities got beautiful beautiful stations like Ann Arbor, 1886. This is Michigan Central, and this is now today the Gandy Dancer Restaurant. At this point, not only was it very beautiful where the passengers were at, but they would often have separate luggage areas. And you can see the luggage building is just as beautiful as the main building. And the interiors were very ornate and luxurious. And so we were really catering now to our passenger traffic. I think we have the uh, railroads to thank for that, for separating us from our trout or our, our baggage as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, of course, where, where the uh, football team would leave from for, for a game away. And, of course, if it was a victory, they would be uh, gleefully greeted when they returned. This is Grass Lake, and this is 1886. At this time in history, we had the World's Fair uh, coming up in Chicago for 1893. And everybody was starting to think about that, and the railroad companies were starting to think about that, and the profits that could be made by taking all the passengers from Detroit to Chicago. And so they were starting to build stations and improve the lines and make them, uh, these general improvements so they could take more passengers to Chicago. And so one day the officials were traveling from Detroit to Chicago, and they were just kind of checking out the improvements as they went along. And so they were traveling on through, and they passed through Grass Lake, and they were looking at the plans. They had them laid out there in the car. And all of a sudden, one of the officials said, stop the train. And he looked down at the plans, and he looked out at the building, and he said, my goodness, they built the wrong station in this town. <laughs> Grass Lake was never intended to get such a beautiful station. <laughs> they were building them so fast, sometimes they lost track. Are you but, going to talk about the, so the land deal? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, Grass Lake didn't exist when the, the railroad first came through. Uh, the, the real town was Grass Lake Center, 
And um, the railroad and uh, the town were trying to uh, negotiate a fee for the price of the land, and 25 cents an acre separated them. So the railroad finally said, well, we can't come to an agreement. We're going to go down the track here, and we're going to put our depot here. Well, you can see what happens, right? Have you ever heard Grass Lake Center? Have you ever found it? No, we couldn't either. Grass Lake Center withered and died, and Grass Lake became the new town center. That's currently a um, visitor's center and art gallery, I think. Yeah, well, they, I think they hold, it's owned by the village or the city, and I think it's a, like an event center, similar to Chelsea. This is Flushing, and it's 1889 now. And um, kind of a, a sad situation here. The, the station had been used as a restaurant, and it caught on fire, and it burned, and it was pretty extensively damaged. And so, you know, folks always ask us, when is a building too far gone? We can't bring it back. Well, it depends on how much ambition you have, how much money you have, how much you're willing to do. Uh, because just about anything can be brought back. And so this is the, the early days, I think that's the back of Ron there, talking with the folks. They had so generously been given this building from the former owners who no longer wanted it. And they were learning about all that they had been gifted. Well, after many long years of several phases of restoration, they were able to raise funds. The city helped with some uh, CDBG block grant funds, and instead of tearing the building down, they were able to restore it. This is what the interior was like. It sat open for five years to the weather. And that's what it's like today. Somebody had a question. Oh, uh, yeah. What happened to the sound force signals that were sitting out front? I mean, what happened to those? To what? The sound force signals. You know what? Yes, I had to take responsibility for that. I thought they were later edition, and I had them removed without researching it. And I know your mouth just dropped open. You know, I learn every day that I'm on the job. I would never do that again. The semi four signals. I would never do that. Boy, you pointed out my mistake. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I would never do that again. And this portion of it was actually originally an open air portion. It was covered by the roof, but it was a separation between the passenger area and the baggage area. And as they restored it and adapted, adapted it to new uses, uh, it was enclosed with glass. This is up in Standish. Okay. So every town wanted a depot because it was commerce. That's what made them viable and they could get their goods to market if they had a railroad company come through, especially if they built a station. And so Standish really wanted to have a station. And so these communities would write to the railroad companies and try to convince them that they should build a station and they should bring their track through their town. So they finally convinced, uh, I think this is Michigan Central, uh, to come to their town. And they said, okay, we'll come to your town and we'll build a station, but you've got to come up with the materials. Well, there were a lot of farms up in the Standish area, and what did they have at the edges of their fields? All of the stones that they had cleared out over the years. So they all brought their stones to town, and that's how Standish got its beautiful stone station. Today it's been restored, and it is kind of a, uh, a rest stop, if you will, for folks that are traveling up uh, that side of the state on old 23. Notice the uh, fence post there. I just now noticed that. The Michigan, Michigan Central, Central fence posts that are there. This is the Davison Depot, and it's located out at Crossroads Village now. It dates from about 1900. Oftentimes, if a building's going to be torn down and can't be saved in its really original position, um, in, at least in Genesee County area, they'll be moved out there to Crossroads Village. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful spot for them. But uh, here, Ron had the opportunity to work on both the depot and the railroad, and the, the track and the trains, and um, was able to be involved in the restoration of both. Yeah, that was my first uh, project out of school. Uh, it's a narrow gauge, 
And uh, uh, it was such a bit poor railroad bed that it was called the Huckleberry Railroad because people could literally, the train moved so slow they could get off the train, pick huckleberries, and get back on. <laughs> Now, it doesn't go quite that slow today, but it is the longest run of a steam-powered locomotive, uh, I think, anywhere in the state. Uh, the locomotives came from um, Denver, well, from the western states, which have narrow gauge through the mountains, and South America. And all the cars, as well as the locomotives, are original. They've been restored, along with the depot. Now, you look at that depot in the background, that's Grand Trunk. And again, we're going to see a sister station. Look at that tower, and then look at Lapeer just down the road from them. So they use basically the same footprint, pretty similar tower, but now we see the hip roof. So after 1885, we start to see some hip roofs start to come into the design. We have those eyebrow dormers on it. Um, and this is a beautiful little station. It was restored. Uh, and some of the unusual grants that it received for restoration included a cultural grant because they were going to allow dance classes to be held inside the depot. It had a great wooden floor, so let's have some dance classes in there. So sometimes you kind of think about how the station could be used to find those grants that can be helpful in its restoration. It's still an active Amtrak station, uh, but it's not manned. So what happens is uh, you arrive a little before the train's going to pull in, the door automatically unlocks before the train comes. You can go inside, and then after the train departs, the door automatically locks back up. Now, we talked about two-story depots, and I throw this slide in to remind me why we have the two-story depots. It was not hotels. It was for the railroad workers in some of the remote areas of Michigan at the time. And a good case in point, a good case in point, oh, thank you, is uh, here at Grayling, and this is a museum. The upstairs has been restored as well as the lower level, but the upstairs is complete with living room, kitchen facilities, and quarters for the train crews to stay when they were in town overnight. We have a similar one in uh, Mackinac City, and uh, this is now a restaurant, pretty good restaurant. If you're up at Mackinac City, it's great. And you say, well, why was this depot built? Well, because of this. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's the, the, the hotel? That was there along the island. What's that got to do with railroads? Until you look at who built the hotel. And I see a number of people shaking their heads, because you know who built the hotel. It was the Michigan Central Railroad, the GR and I, Grand Rapids and Indiana and the uh, Detroit Cleveland Steamship Company. So the idea was you give them a destination, build it and they will come, right? The um, Michigan Central brought people from Detroit and on the east side of the state up to Mackinac City. GNR and I were working on Chicago and bringing them up on the um, west side of the state. And when you got to Mackinac City, you had to have a steamship to get over to the island. So now we see this change of, of this leisure time, if you will, and how the railroads responded to that. Of course, we, Jackie mentioned about the World's uh, Exposition in Chicago, 1893, celebrating 200 years of North American history, discovery, if you want to say, um, with uh, Columbus. And for the first time, the World's Fair was actually open on a Sunday. And that was very controversial, but also exciting at the fair was the electrical building and all the display of electricity. In fact, when they lit all the electric lights at night, the reports say that the women swooned and fainted at all the electric lights. And it begins our, our uh, destination depots. Now this is at Niles. This is still an active station in Niles. We mentioned the clock tower earlier, but this was built as part of the uh, Columbia, the travel that was expected. But it also was the host of gardens for Michigan Central. They had greenhouses here on the grounds until 1954-55 when they finally removed them. Any female coming through the station received a flower, okay? And they provided all the flowers for Michigan Central dining cars. 
and we were talking about this leisure time and with these destination stations. This is Lake Odessa and this was 1890 now. So we have folks with this time to travel and we're building these beautiful stations with these broad overhangs and we're catering to the summer traveler. Um, this one in particular one had to be moved in order to save it, um, but they restored it and did a beautiful job. We have destination stations in Charlevoix and look at the size of that waiting platform that's covered. So we know we have a great influx of population in the summer months, yet the station itself is quite small because in the winter there's not many folks there. So these destination stations are affecting the architecture that we see in terms of the population that comes in the summer. So that's 1892 up at Charlevoix. St. Joseph, 1913, still a lot of summer travelers coming up from Chicago. So we have the big broad overhangs. St. Louis has a large waiting platform. Anybody know why travelers would flock to St. Louis, Michigan in 1923? Well, St. Louis had hot springs, thermal hot springs. And so 1923 was popular for your health to go visit thermal hot springs. And so they have a small station with, with a large waiting platform. This is Jonesville. Again, another beautiful station. Um, very handsome, as we would say, um, Romanesque in style, that heavy, rugged stone base and the brick construction, how well constructed these stations were. Think about them next to that track, train after train going by and rattling the ground where they sit. This one today is a bed and breakfast, and uh, that there's a, started out as a residence and a garage, but now is beautifully restored into a bed and breakfast. This is Muskegon, 1895. Up till this point, Muskegon was all about lumber. They were the lumber capital of the world. They sent out more lumber from Muskegon than anywhere else. And they had a little wooden railroad station. In fact, they nicknamed it the Rattle and Bang because it was so shaky every time the trains went by. Well, lumber was being depleted, and they knew that they were losing their economic resources. And so they were going to need to do something else. And so the forefathers got together and said, what are we going to do? We're going to not have any commerce here in town. And so they decided that if we build a grand railroad station, another industry will come to Muskegon. And so they elected to build this grand station. And they argued for a long time on whether it should be wood or masonry. Wood or masonry. They were known for wood, but masonry was fireproof. And many stations caught on fire from the trains going by and embers flying from them. Well, they finally decided on masonry, and they designed it in this uh, Richardsonian Romanesque design style. H.H. H. Richardson was an architect here in the United States who was developing this style. And it, so we might say that it was very modern for that day. That was a new style being developed. And it's uh, characterized by the heavy, broad arch, the heavy rustic stone at the base, the towers and the turrets are all part of that. Romanesque architecture. So today it's a visitor center and you can uh, stop there, visit, take that trolley around town and uh, is a uh, beautifully restored station. Now we mentioned Union Depots and that if, uh, if the two railroads or more railroads could come together and share one building, they would and that would become a Union Depot. But for various reasons, not always um, might be due to geography, that might be due to political, it might be due to just the railroads going to get together. So this is Battle Creek. I think Battle Creek had four or five stations in their history. But if your competitor, which is, this is what, uh, Michigan Central, if your competitor built a new station with one tower, what would you do? <laughs> you would build a station with two towers. Now, both of those are still existing today in Battle Creek. Um, this is the Grand Trunk Station. This is the uh, uh, kind of community center with a lot of nonprofits in here. And of course, the other station, the Michigan Central, that's Clara's Restaurant. This is Bay City. The year is now 1904. And Bay City was one of those communities that got a large, beautiful station with that beautiful tower on it. And as time went on, as we know that automobiles became more popular and the train traffic declined, 
they began to lose business and they talked about closing their depot. First, though, they decided to try it as a bus station. So they removed the tower and they removed the overhangs, took off all the ornamentation, streamlined it, and made it into a modern bus station. But that didn't last long. And before you know it, it was closed, boarded up, dilapidated. And the community rallied around it and they decided that they wanted to try to do something about it. So first they stabilized it. They boarded the windows, but in a manner that didn't look dilapidated. And they worked on the site and the grounds around it. They improved the grounds, plantings, sidewalks, lighting. And then eventually they kept working on those grants and those funding so that they could restore the entire station. So once known as the biggest birdhouse around town, <laughs> today it is beautifully restored and uh, it's Chamber of Commerce and you can hold events there, have your wedding there, uh, and a little bit of display. Is this me? Oh, it is. Okay. Uh, of course, Durand Station. You know, you notice two dates up there too, right? Well, uh, 1905, the station opened originally, and then it caught fire, burned to the ground, just because the fire department could not get there. They were blocked by arriving trains and departing trains, and it burned to the ground. Now you say, well, how many trains does Durand have? This was a center. This is a Union Station. Uh, 100 freight trains daily, 42 passenger trains daily. That was 3,000 people passing through this depot in this little suburb, but it wasn't even a suburb at that time, this little town in Shiawassee County. Uh, this is a great photo of trains coming and going, and we have postcards of all this, and it's fun to read the backs of them. Uh, something like, do you think I will ever get out of here on time? <laughs> But it's been restored, it's now uh, the chapter, still an active Amtrak station, so you can depart and leave from there. But it's also the headquarters for the Blue Water uh, Historical Society, which is the train that's uh, uh, covering this trail. So when they rebuilt it in 1908, they built it um, just like the original design and on the same foundation. If you go there, you've got to really notice the windows, the curve, the window and glass is actually curved to fit in there. They're not straight windows. The glass is actually curved. What is that? Uh, what is that? Uh, it says Grand Trunk Western? Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor. Yep. Is that Yes. Yep. Grand. And you can still take the train out of there, so. But you really got to be careful how you, I mean, it, you, you just don't drive up to it. You have to kind of go down the road and there'll be a little sign. You go back on this almost a dirt road and make another turn. You, it'll be in view all the time, but it's not a straight in drive. It's a little off because you're constantly crossing tracks. I got caught, I was taking pictures one day and I got caught on the other side and I think Jackie was so mad at me because we were there for about an hour just sitting because there was train traffic going and I couldn't get across the track. Anyway. So we, we can't have a, a conversation without the uh, Michigan Central Station. Um, this was the tallest depot in the world. In fact. And again, the upper part was not hotel as some people think. It was all offices for the Michigan uh, Central. Uh, this was a, a grand station built in 1913, and it had all the amenities that are uh, airports to today. Gift shops, ramps everywhere. You didn't have stairs if you didn't have, want to climb. Restrooms, uh, shops, you can get a haircut, a uh, shower and a shave, um, you name it. It was it was really a, a grand station. Currently owned by Manny Maroon, uh, who has replaced the windows. Uh, what we're going to do with it beyond that, I'm not sure. Um, you know, it's kind of outside of the Detroit proper, which a lot of stations more, we'll see some in a, in a minute, where they were more in the central uh, district of the downtown. This one's a little more removed. But we thought we'd just show you some pictures of what it was and what it is. And pretty much been stripped on the interior. I wouldn't go there without a, a group. <laughs> Now, 
Now this is from so probably 10, 12 years ago now. So this is Middleville 1906, and we begin to see this modernization of architecture. We're losing the ornamentation. Architects argue less is more, and we're going to get rid of all that ornamentation is a bore, and so we're going to become more um, modernized. Again, very sturdily built, very sustainable. Um, the materials that they were using were very high quality materials. But we begin to see that modernization. We also begin to see, like St. John's here, 1921, the influence of the travel that people are doing. People are traveling to the Far East, to Japan, and they're seeing that architecture and they're bringing it back and beginning to incorporate it into our buildings. So the roof that you see there, what well, we might call it a hip roof, is technically a bell cast hip roof with that little flare at the end that they brought back from seeing the Japanese Chinese architecture. Uh, St. John's again, um, stone and brick and very well built. Uh, currently today, they do use it as kind of a rest area for the downtown area, and they have a lot of events in the in the lawn in front there. And they usually have some type of um, nonprofit in the remainder of the depot, so that they have a presence there to kind of monitor things. This is Holland, 1926. Again, large waiting platform because folks came to Holland in the summer months and. While Amtrak doesn't travel there on a regular basis today, they do bring people at tulip time. So that's why we see the, the train there today and, and the tulips in the foreground that they bring large uh, groups of people up to Holland to see the tulips. I want to correct one There is, uh, Amtrak leaves there daily. And I have some well, people. they do now? Yeah, they do. Okay. I was talking to the city manager. And said, actually, we get people, they will park there for free and get on Amtrak, and it's only a short ride into Chicago, and then they can spend time in Chicago, not have to deal with the traffic and the parking down there, take a little ride back to uh, Holland, and they're on their way. We're going to take a little tour of some of the grand stations throughout our nation now. Obviously, Detroit had a beautiful grand station, but as did many other large cities throughout the nation. This is St. Louis Union Station, 1894. So, uh, beautifully these, restored now. These were all stations scheduled for demolition. So, beautiful restoration, adaptively used now for hotels, shopping, restaurants. Uh, very popular destination now. There's the interior and some of the restaurant space. Beautifully um, decorated on the inside. Uh, we see beautiful um, uh, exhibits of the arts of that time. So the sculptures on the walls, the art in the light fixtures, just the craftsmanship of that time period. This is Nashville's Union Station, 1900. Grand Central Terminal, 1903. The interior of New York Central Terminal. This is some of the. This is the station that was saved after we lost Penn Central. So Jackie Onassis got involved. That was that was a big loss for the preservationists, and people began to realize how important these buildings were to the community. And so here, New York Central Terminal was saved from wrecking. Uh, interesting little piece here. Uh, you'll see that there's some type of images on the ceiling, this big arch ceiling that we have. Go to the next slide. Go to the next one, it shows it better. There we go. This was a constellation that was put on the ceiling, and then after they got up, they noticed that it was backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the artist first, well, the, the, no, it was really meant to be that way because it's from God's perspective. <laughs> Chattanooga Union Station, 1906. Washington Union Station, 1908. Again, you know, the shopping, restaurants, destination. Oops. Sorry. This is Lackawanna Station, Scranton, 1908. Uh, hotel space. Uh, and some of these are more affordable than you might think. Oh, back to Union Station. Oh, I'm sorry, this is. And back to this. Here we go, here's a new one. <laughs> St. Louis 
Cincinnati Union Terminal, 1933. So again, as architectural trends are changing throughout the rest of the building uh, community, they're also changing in the railroad station. So we see a little Art Deco design here, um, beautifully uh, designed for train, bus, taxi, all modes of transportation and beautifully appointed on the interior. And this is a wonderful place to go to see some of the uh, depression area art, which was um, commissioned for the walls and the upper parts of the dome here. They passed a millage to help them restore this. And there's a variety of uses in it now. I think the Children's Center is in here. Mm -hmm. Of course, shopping, restaurants. Um, you can still take the train out of here, but that's a very small portion of what it does today. There is a great tour for the railroad enthusiasts. You can, uh, uh, I think it's a nominal fee that'll take you into the director's office, and you can also go up into the tower, which uh, control trade movement in the yard. It's no longer used now; they have a new tower, but it's a great observation point to watch the train traffic in the yard. Now we're going to get into uh, Oakland County depots real quickly here. And uh, I wanted to start with the Pontiac station because this is sometimes, uh, as preservationists, you need patience, right? And just as we saw in the Bay City where they waited 40 years, Flushing, they waited 10 years. Uh, Pontiac, we waited, but then we decided to tear it down. And we rebuilt it, almost in the same location, almost the same footprint, okay? And so there's no reason that, as we've seen, these stations can't be uh, restored and reused, either for adaptive use or for the same use. Okay, so now we also run across, now I mentioned earlier that Oakland County had more depots than any other county in the, the state. And part of that was, uh, we also had the interurban, Detroit interurban, the DUR, okay? Now this was light rail. Not the main lines like we've been seeing before, but still towns connected. And when you look at it, it connected us with Toledo, far south as Toledo. It went as far north as Saginaw and as far west as Jackson. So this was quite an internet. And we had at least six depots that we know of uh, that were built in the communities. So I want to mention that. Uh, also on that, we, we've talked, and this is, this is funny, there was a lot of negotiation going on with the DUR and local homeowners. And we had one uh, audience member came up to us after and said, you know, my dad negotiated with the DUR that they could put a transformer out in our yard, but they had to supply electricity to our home. <laughs> and we knew every time a train was coming because the lights would dim. <laughs> uh, now, Oakland County, as mentioned, just because of the geography, uh, it's a remarkable geography in that we had uh, headwaters of five major rivers, which allowed for mills to develop along those rivers. They used the water power, and that created 32 distinct downtowns, which is a lot of downtowns for any town in Michigan. But then you can see how those town towns became linked and how many depots they were and how the railroads came in. And almost a crisscross, just like we have with the freeways today with 94, 96, 975, 275, you name it, they're crisscrossing. And these are all the towns that had depots at one time or another. So we put together a little storyboard, and I'll just let Jackson go through that, because over time we began to lose this abundance of depots. Some of those depots that we lost. This is uh, the uh, Drayton Plains Depot. It was actually lost to fire, not to demolition. But the uh, Waterford Historical Society was able to get plans of it. They 
faithfully reconstructed it in uh, Hatchery Park. And it's part of a little village there. Beautifully done. Very accurate. In Clarkston, uh, it's still along the train tracks and it's now home to the Clarkston Village Players. And every time a train comes and they're uh, in the middle of a performance, they freeze. <laughs> they let the train pass and they pick it up just like that, not missing a beat. <laughs> Davisburg, as well as Leonard, have become homes. Private residents. And of course, the uh, one in uh, Birmingham is now a black rock. It was not black rock. Big Rock, uh, which is beautifully uh, adaptively used now. What's interesting about Birmingham, this it illustrates the power of the automobile had over the railroads. Um, this was much closer to Woodward Avenue, and in the 20s, when there was so much traffic, Woodward wanted to expand. MDOT said, we need to expand. Of course, the railroad, they were not real keen on relocating all that traffic and depots, and it was only through the threat from the state of withholding their uh, charter that they said, okay, we'll move the depot. And that's what they moved it and built in this place. So it's about one mile <coughs> further east than what it was originally. And of course, Holly, uh, that's a Union Station, as I mentioned earlier, very tightly between two tracks. It's so tight is it that we really can't use it. So they've just met with the uh, two railroads and uh, the antennas were going to move that closer to downtown, but still in between the two tracks. Still own the land is still owned by the railroad, but they seem to be agreeable to at least enter into negotiations so that uh, the downtown can use their depot once again safely. Walt Lake, uh, this was the co railroad. Uh, if you might remember the dinner train that was out of here, the mystery train. Um, of course, the line has been abandoned as part of the uh, water, uh, the rails to trails, which I might say uh, Michigan has more rails to trails than the other state in the country. And uh, we, uh, this has been acquired by the Trail uh, Association, and they're going to reuse that as part of the trail offices and maybe a small museum. We call these AM shacks. Um, <laughs> Just because they were quick, and I think this was one that was in Birmingham, believe it or not, before the new station. Well, and of course, the new transit center at, at Troy. And of course, we're in Rochester, so how can we not talk a little bit about Rochester? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, this is Amy. Uh, this was an interesting people in that, as it said here, the, the station name changed three times because the city changed its name three times. Went from Amy to Auburn to finally Auburn Falls. But what's interesting about the station is that uh, the station workers lived at it. This is the only thing that's left of it right now. Fire and love. But it, it illustrated to us how these people, this became a home to them. And, and this one was very unusual. Generally, you didn't live in the station. But at this particular one, the family of the, uh, the folks that ran the station, whoever was in charge from time to time, um, actually lived there with all of their children. And we began to see these pictures of, you know, a baby and grandmother sitting on outside the depot, right? The, the child in the, the Halloween costume, yeah. uh, probably pretty young, but, you know, probably a lot of kids learned to ride the bike at graduation. And I can just understand the parents saying, well, go out there and stand in the middle of the track. I want to take your pictures. <laughs> but at the one that we gave in Auburn Hills, this is the gentleman that's in that picture. And I asked him, I said, i got to get your picture, but I have to understand, where did you sleep in this people? He said, well, I slept in a bed. <laughs> I knew at that point I wasn't going to get any more out of him. So I just did his picture. But, um, now, I want to back up because we're going to talk about Rochester real quick. And uh, how many here knew about the canals that came into Rochester? Well, okay, so, so. And this was still, this was 1837. I think you have a, yes, it was the Clinton, the Calhoun Canal, okay. I think I have a picture of the stock. 
that was here. But if you can see, it was the idea was this canal would go from Detroit over to Lake Michigan. It would save that time going around the Horn of Michigan up through the Straits of Mackinac. Tremendous amount of time. 1837, this was proposed. Now the railroads hadn't really come into their own by then. But by the time they built the, uh, started building the canal, Rochester already had the, uh, this depot, the Grand Trunk, which was the Michigan Airline. Believe it or not, that was the name of the railroad company, Michigan Airline, in 1879. This is the only picture. Now this was uh, a small depot, but it basically followed that canal route, and that was its intent. The Wall Lake depot was also the Michigan Airline, so we will be tying into that. Now this is the uh, Michigan Central Depot, which you're probably a little more familiar with because it still exists. And a couple of shots here. And this was a gentleman that brought it to town. Okay. Um, he, this is, uh, I never can pronounce his first name. Lysander. 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 Mr. Woodward. <laughs> Uh, he had a 400-acre farm, and his house is still here, just south of Tinkin Road on Main Street. Okay. He was very active in the Grange, and this was unusual, because usually the Grange was fighting the railroads. Railroads, they felt, were kind of, uh, want to say, uh, overcharging them. They set the rates and everything. But he was one of these people that had that ability to kind of straddle the fence, if you will, and find... Um, compromise in the situation. Community leader, he was a county treasurer, supervisor for Avon Township, Justice of the Peace, interested in agriculture and transportation, and as I said, he brought the first railroad. He was also the first president of the Detroit and Big City Railroad. That's his home today. And it's tied, the railroad was tied with Van Heusen Farm. And Jackie's been very instrumental working with Van Heusen Farm over a number of years now, restoring the uh, main uh, museum as well as the cat farm. And I'll let her take it. Well, the Van Heusens enjoyed traveling very much. Of course, many of you are probably very familiar with them. And we just came across this uh, clip in one of the uh, one of the uh, writings that they had there. Uh, I think Sarah had written this. We returned to Chicago for a summer but it was thought best to spend another winter in California. This trip was rather an unusual one, for instead of traveling in the Pullman stateroom, we traveled as a tourist. The car was divided into sections and the seats were covered with cane. But above all, the passengers, if they so desired, could cook their own food. Mother had acquired an alcohol lamp and a metal coffee pot. On the former, she fried bacon and eggs, while potatoes baked and coffee bubbled on top of the large round stove which furnished heat for the car. There was also an ice box in the passenger in which the passengers could keep their perishables. So it was a very interesting way to travel. And, uh, and they certainly uh, enjoyed the different uh, classes and the different ways of travel. So uh, they're, they're very interesting history out there at the farm, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. And we have to thank Pat McKay for providing us with all this information. He's done a wonderful job in collecting and in sharing it, too. So we have this people here. This is a number of years ago. It's been a retail shop. Still is. Very lovely, taken care of. Historic. And I always like this comment. History is where the evidence leads us. But heritage is what we choose to remember and celebrate. And that's what we're celebrating. Now, I have one last slide to share with you. And this is a little depot in Byron, Michigan. Forlorn, forgot, little town of Byron. Uh, I think it's in Shiawassee County, partway between, uh, I think, Owasso and uh, Lansing. Demolition by neglect, we often say. Yeah, demolition by neglect. But then one day, my daughter was home over the holiday season, and we were in the car. And I decided we'd just drive and go by this depot, and not really intending to stop or anything, but just to have to find ourselves on the road. And this is what we saw. So this little neglected depot out in the middle of nowhere had been painted, 
and struck with lights for the holiday season. Who did it? The neighbor. Without asking permission, he said, I'll ask for forgiveness, but I won't ask for permission. He said, I'm tired of looking at it, and I think we need to do something. So with his own money and his own time, he painted and lit the station for the holidays. So when you can save your station like you have here, uh, it's a marvelous thing because it keeps us in touch with our history and our heritage. Thank you very much.